This is Cheryl, the artist of Animal Art by Terracotta, and tonight I'm going to be showing you how to paint a chickadee in the Pigment app. It's a coloring app, but many people don't realize that you can also do freehand work in there. And I recently did a freehand of sunflowers with a little chickadee over it, and many people were commenting on that chickadee. So today I'm going to be breaking down how I did that chickadee in four parts. First, we'll look at the background, and then how to do that light sketch, which is the, actually the hardest part. Then layering the colors, and then the finishing touches that make it a complete picture. And if you watch with me, or even paint with me, in one hour, we will have a little chickadee. What I do need is a background. One thing about it when I'm coloring, I don't use just one palette. I use a variety of palettes. So let's see where I'm going to go. I do want a yellow, but I want a bright yellow. And I'm going to put this on fade. I really like that one. And I'm going to start with just a faded background. I think I want it a little bit white on the bottom. But I'll put a little orange in there. A little drama. Maybe red. And that's looking nice. Put some nice glow there. I think I want a little bit more orange here. And of course, I'll have to put in some yellow. I like that, like quite light like that. Uh, maybe I'll put in some purple. A little drama there. That's looking pretty good. Ooh, that's not looking good. Hit the undo. Okay, so I was using, what palette is this? I was using principally the Roller Rink palette. Usually I skip around, but I guess today I won't do that so much. Um, I think I'm going to hit the vintage sweater and I'm going to do a little bit of background spattering. I'll take the spatter and what size of brush. I don't want it really dark. I'll try that one. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that looks good. And put a little more spatter there. And a little spatter across here, a little bit on the top, and a little bit lighter one. And you'll figure out the colors by just how I'm hitting this. I never pay attention to the color myself. I just go for what I think looks decent. Yeah. And I, I'm going to pick up a little color there. I really like, like that background. It's really light and hit that a little bit. Maybe a little less. Okay. A little bit smaller and light. This light um, lightens it. This is for opacity. I'll make it quite light. And it can still be quite large. I think I want it darker than that. Too dark? Too much? You know, I think we have our background now. I can go with that. Let's put a little bit more white in there. Oops, I've got to pick it up. Tricky picking it up. And I'm going to make that lighter. There we go. Okay, I think we're going to go with that. Yeah. Hey, just have fun, right? <laughs> okay, I think we're going to, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go back to the roller rink, and I do want a little of that purple in, but not with spatter. I just want to put more of that in the fade. So I'll just come over here and do a little bit more fade. I think that'll work. Did I do too much? I think I did. Okay, I'll stop. So now it's time to get our bird down there. And I'm going to go back this to the vintage sweater. This is my favorite palette, maybe. I have so many favorites. I just like the, this color range right here. All of the colors, are, they're beautiful. And now I'm going to put it on airbrush. I use airbrush a lot. I'm going to put it at the lightest, or pretty close to the lightest. 
and I don't know the size. So what I'm going to do, this palette is a little awkwardly shaped for me, so I have to turn a little bit and I have to consider the camera. Ooh, it's a little harder. Okay, so I am going to have my chickadee off here. I want this darker over, a little bit further over, just because of how the colors are going to be. Let's put a little bit more fade in. Yes, oops, what happened? I'm gonna go with that. I need to put a little bit more spatter down. I, I'm trying to make a dramatic background so when the wing is out there, it will have a, a nice bright background, but I do want a little texture behind it. So I have to go back, and this is how I color back and forth until I get kind of what I'm looking for. And that has to be the spatter again. And once I get what I look for, then I am ready to paint. Has to be kind of cool. Kind of liking that. And put a little bit more there. Hey. Kind of cool. Okay, and I need a really white, so lighten it all the way. And maybe that's too much. And now I want it really light. And I'll come through here. Maybe that's too light. A little bit more. Oh yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that'll work. Put a little bit darker, a little bit more drama down there. A little bit more here. I'm gonna put this a little bit smaller. Do that again. And we are ready. Okay, so. I like that background. Let's see if I can mess it up. Now, because I have a textured background, I could very easily mess it up. It's gonna, if I make a mistake, it's hard to correct a textured background like that. So I would recommend a solid background if you're new to this style because you can easily correct it and nobody knows you corrected it. Okay, I will choose this lighter color, go back to my airbrush, turn it on the lightest, and now I have to get the outline of my bird in. So my bird is going to be across here, it's going to be the head, and I will have the, ring, the wings like that. Okay, just getting an idea. Now they're a little bit round. I think I'm going to need that a little darker. So, and I want that smaller, maybe darker. I can hardly see that. I'm going to have to change my color um, and undo that. A little bit further out, extend it up, extend it up, curl it, and this is going to be shaped kind of like bit more pronounced. The body will be yeah that's about right. So I think the I can't see the feathers but I'm gonna assume the feathers are gonna go there. That'll work for me. And now make this lighter for the other side. Probably choose a lighter color, come down, and the wings came across kind of in a line. So, come up, and this wing will come, do it really lightly. I 
make it come around. That's weird. So here it came here, so I'm going to probably make it a little bit more pronounced on this side. Here a little bit more pronounced. That'll work. And then my tail is going to go off the page, which is really sad, but I'm not going to redo it. And then I'll have the tail here. Okay. I have an outline and I'm going to guess on that part. I'm not sure there. I'll figure out something later. And now I'm going to guess on this part. Now because I have a red one here, I am going to make this kind of an unusual colored bird. Um, typically I flip and I'm going to flip this right now. Let me get my pattern in first. The details. I'm going to have a feather there. Another one there. What am I doing? I'm going to be connecting them to this part. I'm going to redo that. Make that shallower. Make this. It's awful big. I think it comes. Great. So now I think I'm going to start with this color. And I'm going to make my yes. So I guess that's about 18. That's just the background. And then here I have to make it quite dramatic. It's not going to work and it has to be a smaller brush anyway. More pronounced. A little bit more. And what am I connecting it to? Okay, so that is what I'm going to connect it to right there. That'll work. Okay, now I have my pattern so I can start laying down a little more color. Okay. And I 
I'm going to put in this color to make it up, to put in some lightness. later. Maybe make this a little bit lighter on some ends right here. Okay. And I want a little bit of lightness there. Now this, yeah. going to put in a sweeping red on top of that. Probably is the same color, but this is a really clear color, so I'm going to keep that. Now I'm going to put my size down just a bit. Let me redo all of that. So this is when I start tapering. So we start with light push and then get heavier. Light push with heavier. have the opacity up a little bit high. And I think I'll try that on top and I'm going to put the opacity way down. I'm just putting a light film on top and maybe the size down a little bit. This time I'm curling it around to make the end of the feather rounded. Put the opacity up, put the size down, and the color darker. I think I got it wrong. I should have more shape to that. down a bit. I'll swipe over the top. Um, I'm sorry, take the color down a little. The opacity probably goes down just a little and the size up a little. Swipe one time up. You're just putting a light glaze of color over the top. I'm going to have to make this larger. Work. 
I'll try a little bit of lightness there. Just for a little pop of the color. I'm not following the picture really well. Not that I have to, but still needs to look good and appropriate, and mine is getting a little off. Let's see. Part of it is there's no curve here to the wing. Can I fix that? Gonna try. Too dark. And there is a longer feather here. Copy in the color, bringing it out. Now we start over. <laughs> uh, got to make that a bit straighter. And there, I think that's shaped a bit better. Yeah, that comes out more. It's too far. I'm at a very awkward angle for drawing, but it'll work. I realize I stopped talking here, so let me explain. The red represents the color of the wings, and the purple that I'm laying down is the shadow. And the darker shadow is the top part of the wing, and I'm trying to leave a, a lighter area just below it. And then after I put in the reds and the purples, the darker red is always at the top of the feather, and it's lighter. I'm retaining the light at the bottom. And then I lightly glaze a purple or a red over the lighter area. And it's just the lightest glaze, which means the opacity is really low and I'm not pushing hard with the brush. And this is a technique I'm using throughout my paintings and a lot of people don't realize that, that the pressure of the brush determines how dark or light it is. I have a very light touch. So this is um, just my painting style or coloring style and it's kind of like the secret of how I can get so many layers without obscuring the lower, the lower layers.
It's too big. Too big. It'll work. Press and lift. Press and lift. There we go. Make it smaller. Take care of some detail in here. A little bit larger. And put the red in the background. And now I think I want just a little bit more of a hint of red at the bottom. And it needs to be a somewhat dramatic red. Too dark. Right now I'm just putting a little bit of red near the areas where the feathers attach to the bird, just to give it a sense of connection. There's also a lot of shadow there, but I don't want to put dark purple. That's why I'm putting a lot of red. There will be hints of purple there later when I build up the colors, but right now I don't need it. We've got one wing almost done. I'll come back and do touch-ups. Shape looks pretty decent. Okay, so this wing needs to be a little bit lighter. We will start with orange. Opacity, we'll put that a little bit higher. Test out the size. Maybe a Ooh, very awkward angle. Pressing and lifting. Pressing and lifting. Okay, that'll work. I think I want it a little bit darker with this color. And I'm going to go for red on top of that. Straight lines. Those feathers are very, very straight. Well, maybe not very, very, but they are straight. Okay. Right now I'm spending a lot of time just making sure that the outline shape of the bird is correct. If the feather is a little bit too wide or maybe the quills are a little bit too far apart or maybe they're not long enough, you probably won't notice it until after the bird is totally colored and then it will be so obvious. So spending the early many minutes laying down the background shape is really important. As soon as that's done, the, the rest of the coloring goes together quite quickly. It's just that background work that takes so much time, and many people are kind of daunted by that part. Anyway, it's necessary if you want to have a good painting. It's hard to say what color I want there. I think I'll make it smaller.
I do like that color there, so I'm going to try to put some more down. I know it looks like I'm painting really hastily, but actually I'm not. It's because I'm painting from a really odd angle, so I have to I have to push the brush a little bit when normally I would pull it. Uh, if I weren't filming and showing you with a demonstration, my left hand would be flipping that picture all around and you would be feeling very nauseated because it's really, um, I've tried to watch those kind of videos later of myself, very exhausting. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm trying to keep a fixed screen, and that means I have to push the brush oftentimes. You, if you're painting along with me, hopefully are turning the palette or the, or the screen so that you can easily paint. You'll get much straighter and smoother lines. Oh, yeah. And this time I'm just hitting the top part. I'm trying to add color and depth, and this is more like the shadowed area. It's also where the quill would be. First I'm going to do a lighter one. A lighter swipe and I want it a little bit large covering all of those colors not too large maybe uh, I'm not liking the color a little bit darker maybe and less not quite so big. I'm constantly changing the opacity, the size of the brush, even the depth of the color with that bottom slider. Um, one thing about it, I know a lot of people use the color wheel and that's possible. If you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see a little square. There's a color wheel there. I almost never use it. I prefer to use the slider. It's just very visual for me and I just constantly slide it, just slightly. Uh, once in a while on pigment we have a single color challenge. And when we do that, I just use that slider for one color. I feel like the color wheel isn't going to give me a fair um, experience because with the color wheel I might change the saturation. but. I could also somehow fiddle a little bit with the color and so I'm not really doing a single color when I do the single color challenge, the monochrome challenge. So it's just something I, it's just my preference, my style of painting. And just one swipe, don't do two because if you do two you'll start to bury your colors. Now I think I need a little bit more drama in a very narrow sense. Just along the edge. I have the background down and you can tell that my brush has gotten smaller. I'm putting in a little bit more detail, I'm putting a little bit darker line where the, qu the line of the quill would be. I'm also being very specific now where I'm highlighting, and when I say highlighting, I'm um, darkening certain areas where I want to start building up my contrast and my values. I'm putting in the shoulder and I'm not putting any kind of hard lines. I never use the, the finest um, brush. I always use a brush that has a little bit of a softness on the end. This is a very soft bird. There are no hard lines whatsoever here, even in the smallest area, even in the final details. 
I was very careful about that. Um, right now I'm putting in a little bit of shade in the body so I can start getting the sense of roundness in the, in the breast and the belly. And you'll notice I'm constantly adjusting the opacity and testing it out. It's really easy to test out any kind of the, the brushes. If I'm testing out a purple in a light area, I can just put a stroke and see if I like how dark it is or the size. And if I do, then I can just hit undo and start painting. If not, I adjust. I have an idea. He's got a wider head than I have here, but that's going to be... That's okay. As I said earlier, when you lay down your first pattern or your first outline, it's really important. It really shows where you're going to be painting later. Well, I notice here that I had the head just a little bit off. And as I was shading it, that was when I realized that it just wasn't quite right. But again, I did that outline so lightly that it was easy to adjust. So what my head was, well, not my head, but the bird's head, the bird's head, I had it a little bit too high and not wide enough. So I just had to widen it a little. And the forehead was a little bit too rounded. I needed it a little bit flatter. So evidently the chickadee has kind of a short, it's still rounded head, but it's not as rounded as I had put it. And the fore, like the forehead is more, a little bit straighter down because they have a very small, sharp beak. And that was something else that I was adjusting. The beak I really did several times. It was not right, I never, uh, marked it in when I was doing my pre-sketching but yeah getting that beak just in the right angle the right width the right point on it I did um, had to hit the undo several times on that one and this is typical in digital painting we have a lot of freedom Some people think that in digital painting you shouldn't hit the undo. I don't know why they think that, because it's digital painting. Nobody knows you hit the undo. They're looking at the end product. So hit that, that undo thousands of times if that's what it takes, because people are judging the end product, not the process. And you're seeing my process. And it's nice to have this insider view that, you know, somebody else does hit that undo button, and I do, I hit it a lot. You'll see that throughout. It'll work. You'll notice as I was shading in the top of that chickadee's head and putting in where the black area is, the little cap of the chickadee, I was using red initially. What I'm doing is I'm just putting down the, like the area where I'm going to be putting the darker. If I only put down a dark purple, it's going to look very flat. But if I build up color, then I'm building up kind of a roundness and a shape and that red is like the foundation color so it puts like a darker area when i put the purple on top the purple over the red makes it a deeper color and i've already built up a lot of color and now i've built up depth and this is really what makes a painting good it's these layers of color rather than just one or two layers you're building up multiple layers and this is this is red on top of the background, so I at least have three layers there, and I'm going to have more before that cap is done. So it's kind of hilarious. I've already gone into Zen mode. Painting is so Zen for me. 
and I just forgot to talk. So I guess the rest of this is mostly uh, going to be voiceover, which is fine. Um, what I'm doing right now is evaluating the colors that I'm going to be putting down. And I'm looking at the purple. I put the purple on the head and I'm trying to like put in a little bit of the darker shading. Now I'm making it darker with a darker purple because I had the idea where the shading is, but I'm not, I'm only doing the side of the chickadee that is more in the shadow. I'm keeping the other side lighter. I want the eye to kind of put it together that we have a shadow there and we have a light side. I'm not going to be using like pinks or yellows to lighten the side. I'm just not going to color it as darkly. In the side that's in shadow, that means the forehead itself above the, the little beak, is going to be very dark and very dramatic. Right now I'm starting to build up my values. And in the neck I've darkened in some more areas. Red is actually, that deep maroon, is actually darker than the deep purple. I can get a much deeper look. And when I use the that dark maroon and then the dark purple, I'm getting something, not black, I don't want black at all. I don't think I used any black in this painting at all. I'm actually achieving really, really dark, intense colors. But I don't want black. Black is flat. Um, so whenever you're painting, you really need to consider how can you make those dark colors with combining colors rather than with using like Mars black or there are multiple kinds of black and they all have different qualities. I don't know the differences in all those, but I do know that for the most part they tend to be a little bit flat and they don't reflect light or, you know, grab, you know, capture the interest of the person. It's like they they suck in the light and if you're using reds and purples there's some kind of glow there still uh, right now I'm using the orange it's not an orange well it's kind of an orange and I'm just putting a little bit more lightness in the lower part of the quill remember as the light is behind the chickadee there's going to be you know on the edge of the feathers there's going to be a little bit more of light permeating through those feathers, not where the quills are, that's going to be the darker area, but where the, you know, the feather is lighter and it's very kind of, it's not gossamer, but it's going to be very light. So there's a reflection of light there. So I'm capturing it with the dark, I'm sorry, with the orange. And then I use a lighter orange or kind of a creamier color just to bring out some little more, a little bit more of an edge. And it's this capturing of this orange against the, pur the deep purples and the deep reds that is actually what is really eye grabbing about this particular picture. You can see the difference in intensities and contrast and that makes a very interesting picture. Working on the tail feathers. Now you'll notice that I'm not putting any hard lines. I told you before it's really not a good idea if you want to have a, an attractive bird. I mean clearly there are lines there but nothing that's really definite. And when I'm building up the, the tail feathers or those wing feathers, I'm use, I'm going back and forth constantly between the purple, that maroon, and then the orange sometimes to kind of keep it light and a little bit of a reflection. The tips of the wings right now are getting the dark purple or the dark maroon. I'm putting a little bit of pressure at the tip and then lifting my pen as I swoop it up, or actually I should say my apple pencil.
throughout most of this painting, I've kept it kind of at the mid-tone of opacity. If you use high opacity, you're going to cover up all of those layers that you've put down. So I put in multiple layers rather than just one time, and I'm actually keeping the glow of earlier layers of paint, you know, shining through. And right now with the pencil, I'm being very careful with the lines because I'm using a finer tip. When I'm in the final stages, as I'm doing the final po polish and just the final stages where I need to work on more detail, my brush is much finer and the finer the brush is, the more careful you have to be. So clearly I have a dark side and a lighter side of each feather. So at this point it's time to start making the feather look more natural rather than just to get the dark and the light side. So I'm putting in the kind of roundness so you have the idea that it's a full feather with light peeping between the feathers as they're fanned. On the right side as we're looking I have it a little bit darker that the bird's left wing is actually kind of more in the shadow, it's in deeper color, but the right wing, the, from our perspective, the left side, there's this glow of light behind it, so I'm putting in a little bit more orange, and then I go through, and because the orange kind of overlapped a little bit of the purple, then I put in my purple and start to darken it again. So it's back and forth between the orange and the purple, but I'm each time I'm making that my brush stroke a little bit finer. In the early stages, I had a very wide brush stroke. I was just trying to get the, the layers down and the shapes. And now that I've got the shapes there, I'm making it finer and finer, more like a feather smoother and with touches of deeper contrast and deeper value. So now it's time for the eye. The eye is always the special part. I didn't initially block in where the eye was going to be. I did that a little bit later in the painting. I did that in bright red. Now I'm putting a little bit of a purple over that red and it's giving it a deeper look, a depth. I've zoomed in and my brush is probably on level, I can't tell, but it's probably one or two or three. It's not at zero. Zero would be, um, I actually get kind of a scratch mark. So maybe when I did the circle around the eye, that might be zero. But other than that, that's the finest brush stroke I did on this painting. Otherwise, you know, because it makes it a harder line. And the center of that eye, where I'm making it really bright, it's not white at all. It's it looks white against, you know, the darker purple, the purple over the maroon, but it's not white. I didn't use any white on this painting. I did some of the like the creams and I would turn down the intensity of the color, the contrast, but I never used white on this one. I think the white would be just too kind of shocking too surprising. I want the colors to look harmonious together and white would be too much of a, a it would be jarring actually. So 
So now I'm working in a little bit of a smaller brush. I keep zooming in and zooming out, zooming in and zooming out. The reason I do that is to see, is the intensity too dark? Is it too light? Does it look good? Because, you know, while you're zoomed in, it might look really good, but when you zoom back out, it might just have too much detail. Because I'm not doing a lot of really specific detail here. I'm painting a chickadee in one hour. So I'm not going to have it like photorealism at all. And if you're too specific in some areas and very fuzzy in the others, it's just not in balance. Although when you're zoomed in, it might look really great. When you zoom out, it's like, oh, something is really up here. And this is where I'm trying to get the, the beak in. I had to put in a fuzzy, soft purple background. Otherwise, it would be kind of like a, a very dark beak on a very dark spot. And that's not what I want. I want people to see where the beak is. So even in the picture, you can see that the beak, there's no line between the forehead and the beak. But in, in my painting, I want there to be a little bit of a definiteness. You as the creator, you can create anything you want when you're painting. What message do you want to give? How do you want the eye to flow through your painting? So I do want the beak to be a little bit defined. So I put that little bit of a soft purpling in the background so I could see where I was going to put that beak. And I did a lot of color and erase, color and erase on this beak. I did it so many times. I just couldn't get the point right. And it was a little bit too thick. And it, and then the point was in the wrong direction. And yeah, I played a lot with it. And how I could tell really whether it was working or not was zoom in and zoom out. So here is the battle. I'm still working on that beak. A beak is not red by any means. It's black. Intensely black on the chickadee. And actually in real life, you know, they, they have a little cap that's black and the beak that's black and they do kind of flow into each other. But I don't really want that. I want something that has um, character in the face. That's why it's got a very bright eye. Oftentimes the reflection in the eye of a chickadee is just a little spot. But I want, I want character to come through. The eye is the window to the soul of the animal. And the beak is part of what's between the soul, between the two eyes. You have a beak and it, that's where the expression of the face is. So I want something to be cute. And chickadees often are on greeting cards or maybe sent in letterhead. I don't know letterhead, but sent in stationery. And they're always portrayed as being very cute, very sweet kind of bird. I never hear anything bad about the chickadee. So if I had a little evil face on this chickadee, it wouldn't look good. So I'm trying to make a, a cute beak. I finally figured out what was causing me to not get that beak right. I actually made the brow or the crest of the chickadee a little bit too prominent. So you saw me a little bit before trimming it down, trimming it down, and this was when that background, the textured background, was a little bit hard to correct because if it was a solid background, I could easily trim down the, the crest and then nobody would know. But that means I had to build up the texture again of the background, otherwise it would be very obvious that I had manipulated some of the pixels. But now I've decided to paint the beak 
not black like it would be on a traditional chickadee, but an orangish or maybe a reddish, a light reddish. And then put in the darker colors on top to make it look like it was black or very dark. And there would be an outline of a beak. And then it would have a very cute face, which is actually the look I'm going for. The black highlighting on the bill and lower at the lower part of the bill and inside the mouth actually gave it a lot of cuteness and character and kind of made it look like a really darling creature. And that's really my goal. It's kind of funny, but the beak is really a small part of this chickadee, very, very small. And it probably took me seven or eight minutes to really get the beak how I wanted it. I really painted over and over. And here you can see that I'm putting a lot of detail into, you know, getting the color right and making sure that point is, you know, not too sharp, but yet it has to be, you know, quite clearly defined. I go back and forth between the reds, the dark red, and then the red itself, the purple. And it's these three colors of layering that gives it this dark look. As I said earlier, black is just not part of this painting. I could achieve that, and anybody can achieve a lot of dark colors by mixing properly. I'm being really careful with the edge of that beak, trying to make it look like a clean line without having a hard edge. And that's probably one of the hardest edges I have in this entire painting. But again, the beak is supposed to be, it's very sharp. It's supposed to be well-defined. And my brush size, I just put it way low so I could get the, I could start working on that lower beak without giving it a real sharp definition. It still has to be, have a very clean, a very cleanly defined line. When you are zoomed in this close and you're using such a fine brush you know you're going to get really delicate detail looking at this right now you notice i'm not using a zero brush a zero brush i did put it in a couple spots as testing and it was just too scratchy and too sharp so even here i'm using i, th I think it's a size one two and three for this and when you think that it's zoomed in, that's pretty sharp. That's very high definition. <laughs> zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. I'm just testing now what is the contrast and where do I need to add some, you know, where do I need to add some more maybe darkness or maybe... I'm in the final stages. So in the final stages, you have to start looking at some of the finer areas. Where to put that polish in? What area to, to work on next? Now, one here and one there. Yep, I think that'll work. When I was first blocking in like the outline of this, I said, oh yeah, I'll work on that later, meaning that area where the feet go. Well, now it's time to figure out where those feet go. 
and I've just defined one here, one there, and I need to get the angle right as I as I lightly etch in where those feet go. I really can't see, so I'll just go with that. And right now I'm sketching in where I want those feet. And what is the shape of the feet? What is the angle? I do want one foot to be a little bit higher than the other. I don't want them to look parallel. That is more like, like, like a bird is going to be landing, but even when they're landing, one leg might be a little bit further extended than the other. So one leg, the further leg, is a little bit higher in the air. And they all, all of the feet have three toes. They're a little bit knobby. And there are toenails at the end. So I first etch in, I'm sketch in, in red. And now I'm starting to put a little bit of purple on top just to build up those colors and to build up the form. And right now the, the color on the back leg and the foreleg are exactly the same, same value. I'll get that clarified so it looks like one is laying on top of the other or one is closer to us than the other one. Depth is really important when you're painting or coloring or drawing, but portraying depth is done by shading or not shading, by darker colors and lighter colors, or there are probably other ways. Like for the beak, I'm taking quite a bit of time for those feet. And one of the main reasons for that is the feet and the beak have sharper lines than the other areas. Like feathers are quite soft. So they you don't need to have uh you don't need to put in a lot of time for those because it's a softness that lacks the definition. But when you're putting in definition, your definition needs to be clear. You need to have pretty good clarity. You'll probably have to build up lines so that you can have higher resolution so the eye can recognize that this is a sharper area. The feet are, as I said earlier, very knobby. And to build up the color and the depth of this, I first put down, you know, the shape, but you can't really tell. And then I start to put in a little bit of lighter color, like a darker orange and maybe a lighter purple around each of the toes so that you can start seeing that there's a difference. You're, you don't want sharpness, but you want clearness. So you can see, okay, the eye is recognizing that those are feet. Not that I need to see all of the detail, but I need to recognize that those are feet and not just like twigs there. Here you can see I'm putting in a lot of the orange as the highlighting color. Orange does highlight purple. They are great complements when you're painting. In fact, purple and orange often are featured side by side in many paintings. And imagine a sunset. That's a daily painting almost, but the sunset, it goes from a brilliant orange to dusky purples in maybe five minutes. In nature, purple and orange appear often together. And so for me to put that in the painting here as, you know, the highlighting and the contrasting colors, you know, for, for brightness and darkness, it's great. Later, I start adding other lighter colors to actually highlight the orange too, because you know, on the knobs of the knuckles of the feet, and maybe on a little bit of the toenail, there might be just a, a small bit of extra highlighting. And that extra highlighting is what gives it more of a naturalness, of a sense of realism and the reflection of light from the environment all around. 
and it also suggests that the chickadee's little feet are not straight, flat, even twigs, but they are knobby. They have form, they have different shape, they have a little bit of folds, you know, around the knobs, and, you know, like we have skin folds around our knees and elbows. So they are similarly constructed. Somehow sync got messed up a little bit, so things are just a fraction of a second off, or maybe a second off. Anyway, what I'm doing right now is trying to get some of the deepest values in. I have finished the feet, kind of, and now I'm working on the deepest part in the forehead of the chickadee. Just getting it really intense, and the eyes, and the shadow under the chin, a little bit more on the beak, just to make that really deep and to make the intense stare of the chickadee just more pronounced, more memorable, more shocking. Now I'm moving on to the wings themselves and I had to do a little test run about how much opacity and how wide is the brush. And I, I test this a couple of times as I change the brush. What I'm trying to do is put just that little bit of a line along each of the edges of the feathers. This is the last or the defining mark of maybe where the spine of the feather is, or I think we say the spine of the quill maybe. But I'm adding that dark defining tone. The eye will pick it up. If you leave everything kind of in that blurry sense without having that one defining area that's darker, then you just don't have a wing that pops. I'm doing that around to all of the quills on the wing. You'll notice that the left wing, as we look at it, is a little bit less defined. There's a little bit more brightness coming through, and that has kind of washed away some of the definition. While the other wing has a lot more shadow and perhaps less contrast, but if I make both wings the same, then it's not a really interesting bird. But to have one a little bit bright, one wing a little bit brighter than the other, seems to add a lot more interest. I'm adding a little bit of light just near the edge of the wing. Part of this is cleaning up the background. As I said when I first put down that very spattered background, it would be very hard to clean up messes. And so I don't want to put an outline around the wings of the bird because that would, it would be an outline around the wings. It's not natural. So I'm trying to just put in some highlight colors to separate the background from the wing itself. And just these touches of color in between the feathers where light could peep through if there was more illumination behind, that is helping bring the wings forward to make the bird not be against a wall that's spattered, but to give it more a depth. Like it's flying through air or space or it's away from whatever is behind it. I would say that adding this kind of depth is something that a lot of people miss. And that is what makes your, maybe your horse or your dog, whatever, get off of the paper and actually look like it's a full bodied animal. It gives it more of a 3D effect by adding just that uh, kind of like a separation of space between the object and the background. 
on the left wing, I am adding a little bit more light around the edges of the wing. It's okay on this side. It would be more natural because you would have from the reflection of the background lighting coming forward, you would have a little bit of a highlighting around the, it's just a reflection on the edges of the feathers. This wouldn't be appropriate in the more shadowed side. Yeah, that swipe of color along the body now gave the chickadee's body a roundness that just wasn't quite there before. Now it's the time to bring the white in. White and the darkest of the contrast, these are basically the last two things that I often introduce into any kind of painting. Adding the white or a lighter color really makes the color other colors pop and I have a lot of red which is kind of a dramatic color and the black pseudo black so having that whiteness against the darkness is really making this a, a more complete picture making it look more finished more developed more natural I was putting a little lighting or highlighting around that shadow wing and I wasn't quite liking it. And there's a darkness around the head and that wing. So I put a little bit of a lighter color right behind it just to make the darkness pop against the background. It creates a separation of space between the chickadee and the background. It's turning a little pink. I'm not sure I like that. Kind of debating with that myself. <laughs> uh, that candy pink had to go. I put a little red over and it looked much better. And it still put the depth between the head and the background. Giving it a final look. Am I lacking anything? What areas? I can do this forever. Pick out this area, make that one a little bit darker, add a little bit more definition. I could do that forever. And I have done that. It's like I go into hyper control mode. It's not necessary. <laughs> I just need to put down a nice picture and learn when to stop. And now I'm adding a little more definition to each of the feathers, each individual feather. Trying to put a little more definition on the end. And then after that, I'll put a little highlighting beyond it. I'm not sure I like the highlighting, but anyway, <laughs> I did it. Putting a little more highlighting beyond it. And so we have the lightness, the darkness, the contrast. Clearly there's a separation but still a slight blur of the end of those feathers in the darker area. I'm really thinking about contrast now. I'm definitely in the final stages and I need to think about a little more brightness. It's quite dark. I need to bring out maybe just more spots of white and under the wing on the brighter side is a really good place to contrast. On the opposite corner is going to be the darkest area and so under the kitty corner corner <laughs> is a good place to put a bit more light which seems appropriate because you have the darkness above and the light below. The darkness on one side, the lightness on the other. It's kind of a, a yin and yang of picture harmony. When I'm putting a lot of the lightness or the white, and it's not white, but it's a, it's, I think I'm using the red 
the lightest portion of the red, which is, there's a faintness of pink there, and if I use the purple, there's a little bit of a hint of purple in the white. But when it's contrasted against this yellow and the red and the bronze, it looks very white. It's not. It's, it's not a pure white at all. But I'm not outlining the wings or each feather of the wing. I'm generally outlining areas. If I outline the wing, then it would look kind of unrealistic. I mean, it's still, it's, it's not a realistic picture, but it doesn't need to look fake. It just needs to look classy, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Now I'm putting in a bit more contrast in the dark just to add a huge contrast or a much bigger contrast between the dark and the light side. That way the wing will kind of The irony on the color that I'm using to kind of add a deeper darkness to the right side is that it's not a red or maroon or purple that I'm using for that darkness, but it's actually the lightest color. It's the peachy color, but when I adjust that color to its darkest shade, it's a brown. And I'm using that brown to push the shadows deeper. And this is actually appropriate because the brown is not a bright color. A brown would be more of a background color rather than a maroon or a red. Those are brighter colors and therefore they would probably appear much closer. So choosing a brown to deepen the background is very appropriate. Right now I'm picking up a little bit of red and a little bit of the oranges just to put a little more color on that breast to separate it from the wing area and to give it more of a 3D effect. Some final touches of red, especially up in the upper part where that wing has a little bit of a whiteness around it. That's not really nice for me. I, it just kind of pops out and I don't like it. So I put a little bit of pure red over the top and it just masked the white. It actually made the white disappear, but it really created a separation between the wing and the background. Just having that lighter glow, but it wasn't white. That's a really neat trick to use in the future. I don't think I've always used it. I'm touching up the body also, giving it a three-dimensional look, lightening the tail, which was kind of important, but I'm lightening it with a different color than the background. I had to obviously put a lot of lighter color in the background in the lower part, and so the tail needs to be a little darker, and it's the opposite at the top. The body will be lighter because the background is darker. adding the last little bit of glow between the fanning of the wings, just between each of those individual feathers. And the head is a little bit fuzzy. That's really one of the focal points of the bird or any kind of animals around the head, the eyes, the face, the, you know, what, how it expresses itself. So I just cleaned up a little bit of the of the blur of color in the background and it made the face pop and made it clear. Putting a little lightening on the cheeks just to give it a warm look. I don't think this is realistic but it's certainly cute. I'm noticing how very dark the forehead and the throat is and this is perfect you do need a lot of contrast not in, not all over the place but in certain areas a little bit of white a little bit of dark 
you get those kind of value differences and those contrasts and you have a more complete painting or coloring if you achieve a wider variety of, of values. I keep zooming out and zooming back in because I always have to evaluate what does it look like a, you know, far away when people are first looking at it as opposed to when you zoom in. It might look great when it's zoomed in, but if you zoom out and it looks just overworked, then you've gone too far. And this is a really fuzzy creation. Not That means it's not so clear. It's not like fuzzy hair, but um, so I need to maintain that. I'm adding the last little bit of touches on those knuckles of the feet. And it really brings, it really separates them from the body because before they were just kind of there in front, kind of attached to the body because I didn't have any kind of separation of value or in contrast. Just that little bit of gold, and actually it's a, it's a lighter orange on top of the darkness, really does bring out, it does make it look more three-dimensional. Well, here we are for the last step. The last step of my paintings is to sign it. However, I will say that after I signed this, I did do a, a little bit more doodling, and I don't think I have any kind of video of that, but I added a little bit more contrast to the background around the edge of the bird in the left side. So I signed my name. I've been using the name Terracotta for, wow, six months officially but I've used it online at different sites, maybe three or four years. So I feel like terracotta now. Also, after I signed my name, oh, I didn't like how I signed it, trying a different font. After I signed it, I put the font size down and the opacity, and I sign it with the date that I create this painting. And this completes my little step-by-step -step digital art tutorial. Or let me just call it a paint with me. If you liked it, would like to see more, please hit that like button. Also, subscribe. <laughs> I hate saying this. Anyway, it was nice having you here and I would hope to see you here again. And I really enjoyed putting this together and I hope you enjoyed watching it. Thank you very much and till next time when I create another animal art video.